स्टार्ट है ना दीज क्लासेज विल बी नॉट टिपिकल प्रेजेंटेशन क्लासेस वेर पीपीटी एंड देन डिस्कस स्टेप बाई स्टेप जूम मीटिंग इट विल मोर ऑफ इंटरेक्ट Interactive classes where we will discuss the concepts, practical aspect which can be asked in the exam. Rest you have to read from the books, your books, uh, O's manual uh, or whatever whatever relevant one uh, you find there. So today's discussion is dengue. So we'll discuss what is dengue, what are the phases of dengue, how you should manage it, what investigations are relevant, uh, what are the phases. So typically. because this is first one i i am going to present it i am going to discuss it from next time either one of you who take the lead and present that thing and then we'll have a joint discussion okay so basically four types of dengues are there dengue 1 to 4 most common is the one and uh, the chances of dengue hemorrhagic fever is maximum with dengue 2 type 2 and in that uh, what we say it, it is usually caused by the uh, mosquito bite we all know what's the incubation period what's the incubation suppose the mosquito bites today what is the incubation period average when can you develop dengue batao one to two weeks for 7 to 14 days ideally the man generally they say from the third day to 14 day is the incubation period but 4 to 7 day is the usual one suppose by today after third to fourth day and within one week you start having fever that's one thing uh, that's the incubation phase and then how the phases are being defined once the symptom starts they've been divided into three phases one is the febrile phase second is the critical phase and third is the recovery phase these are the phases in fe febrile phase you will have fever myalgia rashes you can have all those symptoms in uh, critical phase you will have the symptoms of hemorrhagic fever or shock and in the recovery phase obviously these symptoms start subsiding now before discussing these phases it is important to discuss the classification of dengue dengue so the first classification which came around 1997 or it was before i think uh it was in 1997 classification who classified into dengue fever dengue hemorrhagic fever and dengue shock syndrome but uh, the class cardinal feature of dengue fever was fever myalgia you have petiche you could have petiche rashes you can have uh, mucosal bleeding epistaxis you can have uh, vaginal bleeding all those uh, things were there but the cardinal feature of uh, hemorrhagic fever were to label someone as hemorrhagic fever what are the criteria should be met suppose if a patient comes to you with uh, dengue and now you need to differentiate whether it's dengue fever or dengue hemorrhagic fever say a patient is in your icu platelet count 1.2 lakhs um, he is more or less stable systolic blood pressure more than 100 and the fellow has hemorrhagic rashes all over the body and there is some epistaxis bleed so would you label that patient as dengue hemorrhagic fever sir hemorrhagic fever mein uh... वेद ने कुछ हैंड रेस किया है कैसे करते हैं तो तो करेंगे भाई उसको बोलो फीवर हिस्ट्री to label someone who has hemorrhagic fever you should have a uh, mute karna padega 
you should have fever second you should have hemorrhagic tendencies so it could be petechiae okay, chymosis even positive tourniquet test means you inflate the blood pressure cuff for 2 uh, to 5 minutes and then you develop petechial rash on the hands that also uh, can be considered you can have hematemesis melina bleeding from mucosa injection sites any any hemorrhagic tendency third is thrombocytopenia platelet less than 1000 no sorry 10000 oh so 1 lakh thrombocytopenia 1 lakh and there should be a fourth is hematemesis of plasma leakage so how will you oh, plasma leakage due to increased vascular capillarity vascular permeability how will you define it how will raise is either your hematocrit more than 20% of the baseline or if after fluid resuscitation it drops less than 20% of the baseline suppose you have a hemoglobin of 16 you don't know the what was the base level of that patient you fluid resuscitated patient 1 to 2 liters and then if 20% means around it the hemoglobin drops to 12 hematocrit drops to 12 a uh, hemoglobin drops to around 12 so this patient was in uh, uh, capillary leak syndrome that's why he was in shock and you could have ascites you could have hypoglycemic you could have pleural effusion so whenever there is a pleural effusion or ascites it's a uh, it's a bad prognostic sign so for to label someone as demo hemorrhagic fever you should have all these four things fever thrombocytopenia bleeding tendency and evidence of plasma leakage all four yes. now dengue shock syndrome in dengue shock syndrome what will happen dengue hemorrhagic fever plus you should have a so, narrow pulse pressure or systolic blood pressure less than 90 plus you can have cold calm restless patient means obviously you will have the signs of shock in that patient now the problem with this classification was he at times it underestimates the uh, patients who are in dengue shock syndrome but uh, they are not in hemorrhagic uh, phase means if the platelets are more than 1 lakh but the patient is still showing signs of shock so it it didn't included in uh, dengue uh, shock syndrome so there was a controversy on this so finally they come up with 19 uh, sorry 2009 in 2009 they come up with the after classification and that classification was dengue fever any no, sorry dengue with warning dengue with without warning signs dengue with warning sign and severe dengue only three categories dengue without warning signs dengue with warning signs and severe dengue so in severe dengue there was bleeding tendency there was evidence of plasma leakage shock and fluid accumulation and organ involvement sgot sgpt is more than thousands so and in uh, dengue with warning signs there were abdominal pain vomiting fluid accumulation mucosal bleeding hepatomegaly all these were there but adaptability of this classification is still not so popular but you should have an idea if somebody ask is there any other classification for dengue so dengue without warning sign dengue with warning sign or uh severe dengue so, so this is the classification so important is you need to identify patient who are in suffering from dengue who are showing signs of cap, uh, shock and who are landing in dengue hemorrhagic fever this this much you should know so any patient developing uh, uh, dengue with thrombocytopenia with cold and calm extremity developing plasma leakage pleural effusion ascites is a bad uh, is a patient who needs to be taken um, in some extra care of So this way. So now, oh, the phases. The phases are febrile phases, critical phase, and then there is a recovery phase. In febrile phase, what happens? You have a high grade fever, body ache, myalgia, these sort of symptoms. You can have mild petechial rashes, epistaxis in this. Now there comes in a critical phase. In critical phase, you have evidence of uh capillary leakage due to increased vascular permeability that is the key along with that there is a bone marrow separation in which you have you could have leukopenia you can have thrombocytopenia now what is the cause of uh, thrombocytopenia in uh, dengue mute hai bhai dinesh batao uh, sir it is an antigen antibody uh... 
that causes the uh, 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 destruction of the thrombocyte. Uh, so there are two main major causes. One is your bone marrow suppression, suppression of the hematopoiesis. Yes. That's why you get leukopenia and uh, thrombocytopenia. Secondly, the platelet destruction, direct destruction, by mediated through immune antibody response. That's the main cause. And in critical phase, the important uh, more than thrombocytopenia, the point which is of importance is the patient of the capillary leak syndrome. You have fluid accumulation in the abdominal ascites, pleural cavity, myocardium, uh, generalized uh, swelling, puffiness is there. The point is when this patient develops increased vascular permeability, it is a sign that patient is landing in dengue shock. And even after fluid resuscitation, it is very difficult to manage patient at this stage. So you should identify patients who are prone to land in this stage. And Mind you, thrombocytopenia may lag uh, capillary leak stage. You can have a patient before, with capillary leak syndrome before and who develops thrombocytopenia later on. So uh, patient having signs, giving you subtle, subtle signs that there is a vomiting is there, there is a abdominal pain is there, there is slight tachypnea or the patient is in compensatory shock people, uh, cold gummy extremities. These are the patients you should pick and then treat. Okay? And yeah. when we are discussing thrombocytopenia, we should discuss at this stage okay, at which particular thrombocytopenic uh, stage you will feel that the patient has chances of bleeding profusely. How much level? Below uh, 10,000? Below 10,000, you should transfuse the platelets. But if your patient is in capillary leak syndrome, if the patient is on antiplatelet, if the patient is of CKD, if the patient has uh, some other bleeding tendencies, the bleeding can occur at higher platelet count also. We have seen patient bleeding profusely at 33,000 and we have seen patient not bleeding at 1,000. So it depends. But the threshold for transfusion is 10,000. Now, um, you can, uh, USG is also a good guide. Investigations wise, what, what investigation you will send? Suppose you have a patient, you are suspecting this is dengue, this patient is landing in dengue shock or hemorrhagic tendencies. So what investigations are of importance? The investigations of importance are one, your liver enzymes, Obviously, CBC, you will see the hematocrit value when the thrombocytopenia rise, raise hematocrit is not a good thing. I Means patient is dehydrated or vascular compartment leakage is there uh, thrombocytopenia. But you can have liver enzymes. If, if they are more than 10, 5 to 15 times of the normal, that, that is not a good sign. If your USD showed mild plural effusion ascites, then this is not a good sign. So ascites, pleural effusion are the things we should pick up late. So always advise a USG abdomen and chest x -ray to see. Okay. One point thing we're going to clear maybe from quick. Now, one more common cause of elevated liver enzymes rather than direct uh, effect on the liver is profound shock. If the patient is developing shock and this patient have elevated liver enzyme due to ischemic hepatitis. So liver enzymes also gives you a good idea. We have seen that patient on bed number seven, which, uh, which came with dengue, though she was clinically stable, although there was a slightly low blood pressure, was liver enzymes were eight thousands. And we fluid resuscitated in on the next 48 hours, her INR improved and the liver enzyme dropped to 1,500. So it was ischemic damage. It was ischemic damage. It gives you indirect clue that the patient is dehydrated if patient needs to be resuscitated for fluids. Okay. Now, testing regarding specific dengue. Now you want to assess the dengue profile. So what will you say? You are sending dengue antigen, dengue IgM antibody, dengue IgG antibodies. So in which duration all these three can come separately, separately positive? When can NS1 come positive? When can IgM come positive? When can IgG come positive? 
So anesanta acute infection. Number of days duration. Onset se kitte din? On what is it? Bolo dada, to open karke bol sakte Dinesh bhai. Sir, for anesan first three days uh, of febrile period. Uh, from third to seventh day, uh, IgG, IgM, sorry. And from second to third week, there is a uh, appearance of the IgM, IgG, sorry. First IgM, then IgG. See, NS1 can remain positive up to seven days. So between one to uh, uh, between one to yes. first to seven days, you can have NS1 positive. From third four day to next seven ten days, you can have IgM positive. So there get yes. where both can come positive. And after that, I think we can post it. Now, many times, many times the patient comes who says, he, many times the patient comes who says that this patient is having acute febrile illness, but NS1 is negative, IgG, M is negative, but IgG is positive. So will you consider that patient is Ig dengue positive or not? Mute, unmute. No, Sir, it is a, the IgG is due to the previous infection of the dengue. IgG can remain due to previous infection, but there, uh, when I was reading what they were saying, there is a primary infection and there is a secondary infection. Suppose secondary infection, yes. Sir. You get infected. Uh, suppose one patient get infected with dengue <laughs> now, and the chances of getting infected with dengue again is very less in the next eighteen months. So after 1.5 years of uh, duration, if this patient gets infected with a different strain of dengue, there may be possibility that this patient will have symptoms, will not mount uh, NS1 or IgM, but this patient may have a rising titer of IgG. This is something very unusual which I read. So symptomatic patient with a previous history of dengue or febrile illness with IgG antibodies can be considered, should be considered and looked for um, dengue uh, in certain conditions. But for majority of the settings, NS1 in the early phase and IgM in the next three to seven days, it uh, usually comes out positive. Suppose you have a patient who you strongly suspect dengue and NS1 and IgM comes negative. If you are suspecting, don't uh, dis get disheartened. Repeat after 24 to 48 hours. You may pick it. We have seen many patients. I think we have seen event number eight is also a typical example. He yes, came. Sir. With, he, uh, uh, eight. he was he, one, negative, negative he was uh, he was negative outside, but when we tested it, NS1 came to be positive. It's a possibility that first test could be negative, but you strongly suspect you can repeat after 48 hours. That's why we usually send in our settings that we should repeat. Now you have uh, identified the dengue, you have identified the phases, you have investigated the patient. What is the main light of treatment? How will you treat? What is the peculiar treatment? Patient will complain of patient will complain of severe body pain, high grade fever. Like Siddharth Varga yesterday came, told me that from Jaipur that he is having high grade fever. So I, I told some medications and then asked to take ORS. And now he turned out to be NS1 positive. So how will you treat it? So paracetamol and fluid resuscitation. Sabse Par pehle ha. Paracetamol and fluid resuscitation. So can you, can, for painkiller, can you provide NSAIDs? No, sir. Reason? So, uh, bleed, thrombosis. NSAID induced resection of the thrombosis. Ha, NSAID will uh, hamper the platelet aggregation, uh, platelet function. So, the chances of bleeding gets uh, increased in dengue. So, if you are suspecting dengue, only manage with paracetamol. If at all required, you can give Pontromol, but don't give any any Dynapar or NSAID sort of drug because it is in, in that case no no role of steroid also. Steroid per se also improves the chance of GI bleed. So don't give steroid. It will be, it will be mount the symptoms, uh, get the symptoms, but it will not help. So no role of steroid in dengue. It should be very clear. Don't give steroid. It it may worsen the uh, condition. Now first. 
for controlling fever uh, and pain is only paracetamol. Now the crux of dengue management is fluid resuscitation. Only and only this is the therapy which can help. So in fluid you have crystallite and colloids. You should always resuscitate with uh, crystallite. So how will you resuscitate? How much fluid you will give? Suppose you see a patient dehydrated in uh, impending shock. How, how how much fluid you will give? Bolo, koi to bolo. Benjamin. 100 ml per hour, 150 ml per hour. Dinesh. When you will write the answers in uh, your theory, you should not write 100 ml per hour, 100 ml. There is a certain guideline. MG per kg. So the guideline, guideline says that 10 ml per kg in the first hour should be minimum. Suppose you have 70, 80, uh, 80 kg fellow. You should give approximately 700, 8 ml in the first hour. So usually we give one liter bolus. That's enough. For the, it's all there in the books. Then you could give in the next four, five hours, seven ml per kg per hour. You should give 500 ml per hour for next four, five hours. Then decrease, you can decrease to 250 ml per hour for next few hours. And then uh, you stick to 100 ml per hour uh, uh, continuous. And the patient, when the patient start taking orally, you can reduce this to 60 ml per hour and 50, uh, 40 ml per hour. That's the way. But initial first day resuscitation is most important. Fluid boluses with 10 ml per kg per hour, 10 ml per kg in the first hour, followed by 7 ml, 5 ml, 3 ml, like that. So for all sorts and for practical purposes, start with one liter fluid bolus minimum. If you require, you can give more. Then start for at least 300, 400 ml per hour for four or five hours, then decrease to 200 ml per hour for four or five hours, and then switch to 100 ml per hour. That's the way. Taking in care of the cardiac status and the fluid overload status. Suppose you have fluid restricted, in, uh, and how do you monitor that your therapy is working? So hematocrit. You, uh, you should monitor hematocrit. You can repeat ABG or repeat CBC. After six hours, if you repeat CBC and there is a fall in the hematocrit of 20% or it's a falling hematocrit, that means your fluid resuscitation is working. If still after hydration, uh, uh, with uh, given you have given three, four liters of fluid in the uh, four, five hours and still the patient hematocrit is still not decreasing below 20%, it's somewhere uh, more or less same. So that means still the, there is impending, uh, means the capillary leakage is too much. We need to pull back that fluid from the interstitial fluid. So what is the recommended colloid? Albumin. We gave albumin, but book said dextran. Albumin, albumin is not available at many places so frequently. So they say dextran 40 can be given. And then you restate with dextran. But because in our center, albumin is uh, there, hypoproteinemia is there also in this patient. So, so we uh, we start albumin 10 ml per hour. So, so that helps. That's the way. Then if you have decreasing platelets uh, or you have signs of bleeding uh, like upper GI bleed, melina, or there, you can transfuse the platelet even if the platelets are more than 10,000. But if there is no sign of bleeding and your platelet drops to 10, below 10,000, then you should transfuse. That's the thing. No role of steroid. And then the complications of um, uh, bilateral pleural effusion, ARD, uh, liver uh, failure, they are all supportive. It means BiPAP, albumin, Mucomics. If the patient develops AKI, not responding to fluid, then you can have diabetic challenge later on uh, along with albumin or then you can have dialyze the patient. That's the way. One more point. What are the other manifestations, rare manifestation of dengue we can have? Dengue can present with encephalitis. Dengue can present with seizure. There are certain patients who can present with uh, nasal congestion, cough, with dengue. So these are the, 
I I see you know, uh, Rahul's friend Neha yesterday came from Delhi. She was running high grade fever for three days, and then she was having running nose and this. I don't know how her dengue came out to be positive or not, but there is. You can also have patient with respiratory symptoms manifestation in dengue, not classical, but encephalitis, seizure. There. One important point: differentiating uh, differentials of dengue are malaria, leptospira. Enteric fever, even you can have COVID and Zika. Zika can also be there. Uh, acute HIV infection could be there. But if, uh, the um, in Zika, uh, conjunctivitis is one of the prominent features. Other than fever, myalgia, and all those things, conjunctivitis will be prominent. If you are having patients with dengue-like syndrome, plus uh, having uh, conjunctivitis, then Zika comes into the picture. This, this was the thing. So this was in nutshell about 30 minutes about the dengue. So this, this is the way you should ask. The crux is identify patients landing in critical phase, impending shock. Don't trust on the uh, thrombocytopenia. You should look for the liver enzyme. You should look for the pleural effusion. You should look for the USG abdomen for ascites. You should look for facial puffiness. You should look for cold and calming extremities. Resuscitate the patient. Don't give NSAID. Only treat with paracetamol or contramol. If your fluid therapy is not working, start with colloid albumin. That's the way you should. And when this three to seven days of critical illness pass, patients start recovering. Uh, then there is a, uh, they recover very fast. Weakness can persist for a few weeks. That's the thing. Now we have five minutes left. Anyone have any questions can ask. So I, what I would like is you can you go through the book uh, uh, in identifying what are the investigations, clinical features, which uh, tells you that this is a severe dengue or patient is dengue, landing in dengue shock. And then read the treatment flu resuscitation guidelines. These are the two important things <coughs> you should be aware of. Dinesh bhai, theek hai? Drive away. Wade will ask, Wade will rectify why Wade was not able to connect, get connected. Uh, I hope he has listened to this. Benjamin, theek hai? Yes, sir. So this way we will discuss certain. If, if we require more than 40 minutes, we can purchase also the Zoom meeting. But I think this is a good platform where we can have regular classes at least. And from next time, we will open it to uh, other people also. This was a trial class. First class was there. I think it's okay. At least we need continuity of um, learning. Sir, if a patient is on antiplatelets and to her mother, for example, post CABG patient, they have coach. So, should we stop it for some time? Stop the... Yes, if it is a acute... Uh, uh, sorry. Like recent, uh, within one year of uh, angioplasty is there. You can stop for two, three days because the ecosprain antiplatelet effect remain there in the body for five to seven days. It's a reversal. But if it's a CABG patient where the grafts are there, you can safely stop for four, four to five days. That's the thing. In CABG, because there is no stand, only there is a graft is there. So stopping for two, three days never creates a problem. And sir, CKD patient with fluid resuscitation, is there a different, separate That's guideline? a different story. That's a different story. CKD patient, whether on dialysis or not on dialysis. That's the th thing. If CKD patient has developed dengue and it's in the shock, you need to give, uh, you need to hydrate a little bit. You may not resuscitate with one liter of bolus, but still you will start with 100 ml or something. And then you will dialyze early. See, we need to uh, take care of the capillary leak. We need to hydrate the patient to maintain, uh, to uh, maintain, uh, treat his shock. So shock can be treated with fluid and vasopressors. Vasopressors won't help. You need to treat the shock. The risk with CKD patient is he may develop uh, fluid overload, respiratory distress. So already he must do two, 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 three times dialysis. You can dialyze early with support, but hydration is important. 
yeah, you always have a uh, uh, you need to balance. Like in bed number nine, we have ten percent ejection fraction, but we need to hydrate. We are putting the rice tube and then giving the free water. Free water. I think we can stop here. Any questions we can discuss on the group. And uh, uh, go and read the guidelines. Picking up uh, severe dengue, what are the investigation can they help and how you will manage with loop guidelines. Okay? Sure.